Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to need a little bit of you all's energy. My flight was delayed last night, got in like at 1 a.m. Um, and I woke up like, am I late? So, um, so I'm going to talk about um, HIV equity for African immigrant women in the U.S. Um, you already heard a little bit about me, um, but just to emphasize, my area of work is actually at the intersection of um, immigrant rights, um, HIV and sexual health, public health, um, and then also racial justice. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the HIV epidemic amongst African immigrants in the U.S., share some uh, HIV care challenges, um, and we can even say not just care, but prevention, um, and then discuss some strategies around how do we maximize outcomes for African immigrant women in a way that actually African immigrant women living with HIV are leading. So here in the United States, um, since 1980, we've seen a huge growth in our African immigrant population. Um, you'll see that, you know, we started off in 1980 with 130,000 and now we're up to 2 million. A lot of that has been um, migration due to people wanting to go to school, find jobs. Um, the, there's a fallacy where uh, that folks are saying that, you know, African immigrants in particular are coming, you know, through undocumented uh, ways. But really, the majority of African immigrants are coming um, in uh, legal ways where, where they're, they're seeking school and, and work opportunities. Uh, most recently, we started really having a national conversation around HIV and African immigrant population, and it, it's been coined as a hidden epidemic. And one of the main reasons why it's been coined that way is because of the way that data is collected and the way that data is reported, right? And so here in the United States, it's really data is collected um, in a way in which we categorize, categorize, categorize people um, across racial um, categories, and there isn't a disaggregated approach. So for African immigrants, um, typically get lumped under black slash African American, um, which is a wide range of a population, right? It's US born as well as foreign born, foreign born from Africa, from the Caribbean and other places. So it really isn't until like maybe about 12 years ago where we really started saying, okay, we need to look at this, ep this epidemic, particularly around um, uh, black immigrants, African immigrants. And there's a huge difference when we think about, the, when we look at the epidemic. Here in the U.S., it's primarily male. When we talk about the African immigrant population here in the U.S., it's female, which we see that also on the continent. Um, in the U.S., majority are uh, men who have sex with men and women. And for non-U.S. born, the majority are heterosexual African women. Um, we see a small decline amongst women. However, we also know that numbers are underreported again because of the way of data is, is not disaggregated, but then also the way in which stigma plays a role in people getting tested and knowing their status. For the most part, uh, most uh, non-US born are more likely to uh, have late diagnoses, which means that they have an AIDS classification within three months after their HIV diagnosis. This diagram, this uh, analysis, I really appreciate um, was done because it really shows more, again, how we need a disaggregated data here in the US. Um, African-born women are five times more likely to be diagnosed compared to US-born black women. Uh, when we just look at the difference between African-born men and African women, there's uh, uh, two, two times more likely to be HIV diagnosed, right? And so this actually tells us that we need to look more green granular at what's happening within our black population. Um, and, and what we're seeing in terms of where people um, are living, or we're even seeing this trend locally at the state level, um, this shows that uh, where, where we see majority of immigrants um, resettling and or where we see significant number of black communities, um, we see this trend of um, African immigrant women um, being um, most vulnerable. Uh, and so you'll see that in urban areas, um, that mostly African immigrants are, um, even black immigrants reside in mostly urban areas. So when we look at the, the 
epidemic, right? In summary, what we do know is that African immigrants print, present with an HIV diagnosis and more advanced disease compared to their counterparts. Um, Although that is the case, once we have an African immigrant client in care, they have higher retention rates, right? And so it's really about getting folks in care, um, and then they end up staying in care and, and reaching um, um, and, and being in good status. Um, they experience uh, barriers to testing and care in their home country in the U.S., and that really impacts how they engage or if they engage here um, in the U.S., right, based on their experience in their home country. There's a significant number of folks who uh, get are, are uh, infected or exposed to HIV post-immigration in the U.S. And this is very important. I actually advocated for this study not to happen, given the anti-immigration laws um, and sentiment here in the U.S., because it could be very harmful, depending on what the findings. Um, and so I use this lightly. <laughs> um, but it is important to, to, to show this because of the ways in which uh, HIV individual people living with HIV and the intersection with being black is criminalized here in the U.S. Um, and then we see that there is a correlation between HIV, hepatitis B, and other um, infections. So I want to frame sort of the rest of what I'm going to talk about uh, in the lens around health equity. That's very important and critical because we can no longer have an individual level approach um, because the issues are not based on what people can do, what people know. The issues are based on how our systems and our policies um, create barriers for people based on um, their identities, whether that's race, gender, sexual orientation, and other identities. So this is a picture you might be familiar familiar with. Um, it shows like what is the reality and what's the difference between thinking about equity. And I like to go all the way to the right and say let's talk about liberation and let's rem remove all barriers, all structural barriers that prevent people from being healthy and living healthy and, and how do we think about uh, health as a default approach. Uh, usually when we talk about health equity, right, we talk about social determinants of health. Other people like to call them political determinants of health to be clear that this is within structure um, and policy. And so this is outside the clinical setting, right? We're not talking about what's happening within a hospital um, or between um, client and provider. We're talking about what's happening outside in society, where people are born, where they, where they grew up, where they live, where they work, uh, where they pray, and where they play. So I want to introduce you to my client, Astu. Astu is 39 years old. She is from Rwanda. Um, she comes from a rural area in Rwanda, and she's illiterate in her native language as well as uh, the official languages of the country. Her husband recently died, which um, um, caused her family to want bring her to the U.S. Uh, to help her sort of make money and send money back home. Um, she came on a visiting visa, um, and really the goal was for her to babysit and take and do house duties for one of her relatives. She overstayed her visa, um, and she leaves behind two children um, in Rwanda with family members. So this brings up the issue of immigration, because before we, I can even talk to you about her HIV status, whether she's in care, uh, we have to deal with the fact that she is now undocumented living here in the U.S. Immigration is socially defined as well as a social determinant of health. Socially defined meaning there are individuals uh, in, in, in privileged, empowered positions making decisions on who has access, not only into this country, but based on you being in this country, what you actually have access in terms of resources. And so when we think about immigration um, as a social determinant of health, this is really what I see with my clients, my African immigrant clients living with HIV, or even you know, vulnerable to HIV. There's a fear of discovery, immigration authorities. We saw during COVID-19 here how um, immigration authorities were at COVID-19 testing and vaccine sites and actually arresting individuals and, and, and causing deportation. So this is a real fear. It's not a perceived fail fear is a real fear. Folks are not able to have access to health insurance, so they don't know how, to, how they're going to pay for any kind of health services that they receive. Even though here in the United States, uh, Ryan White, which is our federal program providing services to people living with HIV, says that you can get services regardless of your immigration status. We know in practice that people are being denied. Um, folks are concerned about uh, 
uh, being tested, pos testing positive for HIV, because that might even impact them wanting to go for citizenship or, um, or uh, other statuses um, that put them um, in legal um, uh, positions. Um, and then overall, what we're seeing is immigration policies are literally changing by the day. So on Monday, my client is, is documented. On Tuesday, my client is undocumented because the government decided to lift the TPS, the Temporary Protective Status, um, due to uh, they don't think their country is no longer in war, right? And overall, there's a criminalization that's happening um, with immigrants of color. And so now Astu shows up at the emergency room complaining of fear and chronic diarrhea. Um, the nurse does an assessment um, and realizes that uh, she, the checks x-ray reveals that she has pneumonia. And during the workup, she decides that she um, needs to get a rapid HIV test. Um, she tests positive. Because of the results, she's very concerned um, about Astu. Um, and so she is going to, she wants to um, give her her status of course on the spot. Uh, the nurse requests that the relative that she came with uh, leaves so she can give her a, the pre preliminary diagnosis. And she talks about, she gives us to the preliminary diagnosis and us to just says, okay, okay, okay. And, and leaves, okay? So now we're starting to get into some issues in terms of once an individual uh, African immigrant um, potentially living with HIV or living with HIV um, is, is connecting to the, to the health system, right? Um, and this is a paper that I did that really outlines the ways in which there are intersecting social identities and how those intersection of social identities are socially oppressed. Um, and what does that look like in terms of the impact on uh, Africans living with HIV? HIV. So now as to, particularly in her case, is dealing with language oppression, right? Um, and even do it dealing with ethnicity, right? There hasn't been a conversation about where she is, where she's from, what language does she speak, how can we bring in interpreter services? And, and when I talk about language, I just don't mean sort of what is your native language, what is your, uh, what, uh, what is the native language you speak. I also mean dialects and accents. You know, we have languages that are spoken throughout the world, um, and just because you hear French um, in Paris. French in Paris is then different than French in Canada, which is different than French on the west coast of Africa, right? And so really thinking about that level of dialects and accents is very critical when we talk about language justice. So now, now Astu um, is leaving. She gets uh, antibiotics from the nurse. The nurse uh, thinks that she's made an appointment with Astu. Astu returns back to her relative's house, finishes the antibiotics, feels better, um, never refills because she doesn't understand that she needs to refill, that misses her follow-up appointment to get a confirmation test and to, uh, to enter into HIV care. The case manager has a difficult time getting in touch with her or getting her to come in. And so the case manager, because the case manager is my friend, she calls me and says, hey, Chioma, I have this woman. She's an African woman. I need help in trying to uh, not only talk with her, but bring her in. This is where we bring in the importance of community clinical linkages, particularly um, really to sort of support individuals um, in coming in and linking to care, but also to support our clinical institutions in better serving outside of clinical issues, right? Because our, our clients are dealing with housing, they're dealing with immigration, they're dealing with so much, um, they're looking for employment, that their, their HIV care is the last thing on their list. Um, and so clinical linkages can be talked about, can be explained as connections between community and, cl and clinics uh, to improve population health, um, but they can also be uh, further explained to, to think about the connection between providers, community organizations, and public health agencies, government agencies. Um, this is how I like to talk about community clinical linkages. linkages. Um, I like to talk about them as relationships, long-standing relationships, right, um, and cultivating these relationships. And they operate in multi-dimensions. So you have the relationship between the clinical site, the clinician, and the community-based organization. But there's other like, relationships happening between the community organization and the community itself. And then how is the institution perceived by the community? That has a lot to do 
do on whether I can get my client to come to that institution or not? What does that relationship look like? Is there historical abuse and harm that has happened that, that has sort of, the whole community has talked about, don't go to that, don't go to that hospital, you know, because they don't treat you well, or don't go to that hospital because they'll tell you business, right? Word of mouth is the most powerful way to get things out, but also the most <laughs> hard way to, you know, address, right, uh, to intervene on. Um, and so I think about, you know, when we're building community clinical linkages, we are thinking about this, this uh, multi-dimensional approach. Um, so community clinical uh, uh, relationships need to be embedded within the organization. We need to think about them as long-term, multi-directional. Um, they need to be mutual, mutually beneficial to all involved, right? And so if my organization is doing a lot of your linkage and navigation care, I should see that in, a, in my budget. I should see resources supporting staff. I should see resources supporting transportation and all the things that really get clients there, right? And there needs to be an intentional approach to think about and address these social, emotional, and behavior determinants of health. And of course, in that relationship, we're in a relationship, we're going to be able to provide ongoing feedback to each other for the purpose of improving the health of our, our mutual client. So now us two, we were able to actually link to, because we have connections within the African immigrant community um, throughout Massachusetts, we were able to identify the um, association uh, that was able to identify someone who spoke her language. Um, and then, because of this relationship that we had with the clinical institution, we were able to support her around housing, ESL classes, legal assistance. But it doesn't stop there. I still ref refuse to join a support group, a HIV support group. Um, and that's important in our work, right, that peer-to-peer -peer, um, support. Um, and she would only talk to her clinical provider, her interpreter, and our staff member. And we know that that has a lot to do with HIV stag stigma um, within this population. This is a study that we did where we did a survey um, engaging um, more than 1,000 um, black immigrants um, identified as African or Caribbean or US born black. And you'll see here that um, the uh, Caribbean population has high stigma, um, and also the Caribbean population has high uh, knowledge, but in comparison to U.S. born, even African populations um, have higher stigma and higher, uh, 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 in a, a higher percentage of uh, low HIV knowledge. Um, and this brings me to also, when we talk about stigma, we have to think about stigma as it relates to people um, uh, connecting to their home country, right? Folks come here to the U.S., they're not like coming here to the U.S. and forgetting everything, right? Forgetting their culture, forgetting their language, forgetting like who they are, forgetting their family, right? There's a strong connection there. And in my situation, what I've seen is that People do not want even their HIV status or want people to know anything about themselves, even in their local uh, country community, right? Because of the fear that it's going to get back to their home countries. I had a, uh, a client where she actually, that happened to her. Um, she decided to publicly speak about her HIV status. Um, it got back to her home country um, of Kenya, and her children were kicked out of her family's home. So there is a true sort of a real uh, issue around stigma, not only how it impacts them here, but also how it impacts them back home. Um, and this just shows a study that we did with about 45, a qualitative study we did with, with about 45 African immigrant women um, that shows that uh, a significant issue that we have to uh, address is the mental health of our, of our population. Um, many women, um, especially refugee women, African women, um, are being exposed to HIV due to rape um, because they're coming from war countries and we know rape is used as a weapon in war. And so how do we support them, have trauma-informed services um, so that they will uh, be able to live healthy and deal with their, their disease? I'm going to move a little bit quick. This just reemphasizes the importance of thinking about trauma-informed services, thinking about mental health services related to this population. And I want to just close with also giving some like, okay, I said all this, but there's stuff we can do. 
there's really stuff that we can do. We can think about our HIV surveillance systems and how are we collecting, analyzing, reporting disaggregated data. We can think about at our local level, how are we prioritizing populations. Um, in a lot of ways, African immigrants are not prioritized at the state level. Um, we can think about how are we building capacity for African immigrant-led organizations, for uh, organizations that were founded by re African refugees or immigrants. Um, how do we build their capacity to actually do this work. I'm a strong believer that those that are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And how do we think about meaningful community engagement? Not a community engagement that's transactional, but actually community engagement that provides space and opportunity for African immigrant women living with HIV to actually lead this work. Uh, we have a huge movement, movement here in the U.S. around community health workers. And then we also have this structural intervention that's gone, that's done pretty well over the past sort of, I would say, 10 years called medical legal, legal partnerships where clinical sites are actually creating partnerships with pro bono lawyers or attorney offices so that there's a, tra a smooth transition to support clients in um, stabilizing their immigration status. And then we need to have state and federal laws to actually protect immigrants. There is a federal uh, a state um, law that some states have, have adopted called um, Safe uh, uh, Communities Act, um, and that means that they will not uh, connect uh, their surveillance data uh, to uh, immigrant uh, INS, right? Um, and so that is a great law, but we also need to continue to enforce it. I want to end by introducing you to three initiatives that I really want you all to celebrate and, and get on. I'm, a, I'm an organizer and advocate, so I have to end this way, right? So National African Immigrant Refugee HIV AIDS and Hepatitis Awareness Day, September 9th. Last year, we just got it approved as a federal holiday, I mean, a federal HIV Awareness Day here in the United States. I should hear some claps after that. It took... It took 10 years to do this, 10 years to make this happen. But now it's a federally recognized HIV Awareness Day. Um, Sisterhood Ashe, this is an African, this is an initiative uh, funded by VIVE, or Risk to Reason. Um, it is a peer-to-peer -peer network led by African immigrant women living with HIV in the US. We have an upcoming uh, virtual celebration. Please attend, we always have fun. Um, yeah, and you can get some gifts if you, if you uh, answer some good questions. Um, and then this is the last initiative to support the work that needs to happen um, at the state, local, and, and um, national level. Uh, the Africa's Immigrant Health Research Collaborative is having a conference. This is not HIV specific, but it will include um, conversations around HIV research. So thank you, and I look forward to having a discussion with you.